I would like to introduce a particularly special guest. Uh, I have been trying to hunt down the great Ravi Zacharias for years. Some of you know, if you go to SocratesInTheCity.com, I've interviewed all kinds of people there, and people always say to me, have you had Ravi Zacharias on? And the answer inevitably, sadly, is no, because Ravi Zacharias never touches down long enough in the United States where you can capture him on film. Uh, until today, somehow, I'm not sure, we got him into the studio in New York City. Ravi Zacharias, welcome. Thank you, sir. What an honor to be with you, Eric. I feel I, this is like a spotting the white buffalo or something, some rare beast that is never seen, fabled beast. And to have you with me in the studio, we've, we've tried such a long time. Now, I know, Ravi, there's so many people that they know you, uh, but there are many people listening right now who are saying, who, who's this guy? And I thought that's precisely why I do the program, because I have the great joy and honor of introducing folks like you uh, to new people. So I think of you as an apologist for the Christian faith, principally, uh, as an author of innumerable books. You really do travel around the world uh, incessantly. I mean, you, you really have an international life. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Um, but there are many people who don't know your story, and I don't know that I've ever heard you tell your story. So I thought before we talk about what you've got uh, happening now, I wanted to introduce my audience to you, to Ravi the man, and to tell, to tell your story. So tell us where you grew up, how it was you came to faith, and how it was you came to be what we call an apologist for the Christian faith. First of all, thanks for having me, Eric. You know, love your work, love your books, uh, those massive tomes that you put out there, which uh, linger for a long while on many a journey. So thanks so much for what you're doing. Uh, yeah, even though the last several decades have been in the West, uh, I was 20 years old when I moved to Canada, but at, prior to that, my home was India. I'm an Indian by birth, born in the southern city of Chennai, where the language is Tamil, and raised in the northern city of Delhi, where the language is Hindi. India has many major languages. Well, my dad was from even a different state, Kerala, where the language is Malayalam, which I never got to learn, but Tamil is okay for me. Hindi, I'm quite fluent in. You, you speak Hindustani? Yes, sir. Yeah, Hindi is the, is the short for the Hindustani. Yeah. Yeah, actually very comfortable with it, because all of my friends spoke Hindi growing up. And the movies, if you see the movies in India, which is the major avenue of communication, I was a moviegoer every Saturday. Uh, but that's where I grew up, in Delhi. And uh, the interesting thing is, even though we were nominally Christian, and I mean that very literally in name, meaning more what we, what we are not. We were not Hindus, we are not Muslims, we are not Buddhists, we are not Sikhs. So we are branded as Christians. Five generations on one side, seven generations on the other side, our ancestors came to Jesus Christ. A fascinating story, uh, but I did not know Christ at all. I went to church. It was a cultural thing. Every Sunday, early morning, an ang a very uh, beautiful Anglican church, but I can't tell you one single sermon I heard there because my heart was not in it, my mind was not in it. I was a lover of cricket, and all of our cricket matches were played on Sundays. So I was going to ask you, was cricket a Hindu god? No, it's a sport. Um, <laughs> The, the, uh, the your experience, of course, is is quite typical. There are many people around the world for whom Christian faith is a cultural experience. That was mainly my yeah. uh, story up until I was in in my twenties. So, uh, what did you think you wanted to do with your life when you were a teenager in India? When I was a teenager in India, sports was everything to me, and uh, that's what uh, built a great wall between my father and myself because there was no money in it. You know, it is just a profession. Uh, I want to play cricket for India. I, I didn't realize when you said you loved cricket, you really loved cricket. I did, and uh, you know, India is one of the major cricketing countries. England, New Zealand, Australia, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, they were the five or six major countries that played it. But they were not professional cricketers. They had to be working elsewhere, and then when the so-called test matches were played between two countries, which would happen once a year or once every two years, They'd come out of their professions. You could be working for the railways. You could be working as a teacher somewhere. So I don't know what I was really thinking. It was not going to be a means of support. You, you were thinking exactly what I was thinking when I told my parents I wanted to be a writer. 
you know, it's like, okay, and what are you going to do yeah. to pay the rent? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's it. Uh, okay. But my dad, uh, th that built a uh, tension between him and me. Uh, and then what actually happened, Eric, in the most serious, serious most stage of my life, uh, you know, I've always been a pursuer of meaning. I don't just do things. I don't just write for the sake of writing. What is the purpose of this book? Am I contributing anything new in what's happening here? Why am I speaking on this subject? You know, what is marriage going to mean? Uh, what is this afternoon with my son and me going to, going to accomplish? So the fact is, I was looking for tiny little meanings, but I had no ultimate meaning. Uh, when you talk about Hinduism and the pantheistic worldviews, they don't talk about meaning. It's all a cyclical thing. Yeah, every birth is a rebirth and the, the repetitive nature of life. So at the age of 17, I ended up on a bed of suicide uh, in Delhi. And that, uh, to me, till this day, is a very emotional thing. I hardly ever talk about it to my family, although they, when I wrote my book about it, Walking from East to West, I asked their permission. I said, this may embarrass the family. What do you think? And uh, they supported me. I have four siblings. And uh, on that bed of suicide, which is, you know, you write your book on miracles. Uh, why did it happen this way to me? Why did this man come into the hospital room with a Bible in his hand to talk to me? I have to ask you, when you say you were, found yourself on a bed of suicide, I'm not clear on what happened. Had you attempted to yes, kill sir. yourself, yes, and then indeed. you found yourself in a hospital having survived? That is correct, but uh, hanging on by a thread. I had uh, taken poison uh, that I had brought with me and uh, mixed it with a glass of water, some chemicals that were marked poison in the science lab, uh, and... Uh, you know, it, it's still a very painful thing can, to talk about. But, but can I? But was. can I ask you what led you? That's a very dramatic thing for for a 17 year old to uh, try so seriously to take his life. Can you say what led you to this? In India, it's not that uncommon, and especially during examination time. I could name two or three classmates of mine who more mercilessly ended their lives. My one of my closest friends. Uh, you know, dumped kerosene on himself, set himself ablaze. His, his father had a big business there. Uh, it's a culture of honor and shame. It's not exaggerated. India is a culture of study. Study is the number one thing. That's why even when they go abroad, they do so well. They will just pour themselves into the books. They will memorize. They're mathematicians to the core, scientists, computer engineers. And the competitiveness is very real out there. And I just had, didn't have the discipline to do it. My class, my friends did. I was looking to the cricket pitch every day. But that attempt to poison myself failed. Uh, and I've often said, when I used to tell my story, the concoction that I made and took into my system turned out, I said, unfortunately, turned out to be very salty and my body started to reject it. And I remember a doctor saying to me in the audience, don't say unfortunately. It was that saltiness that caused the body to reject what you'd put in there. And uh, as the moisture was being thrown out, so was the poison. And uh, I was in the hospital for five days uh, before I was released. And uh, it did a lot of gastro, uh, gastronomical damage. Uh, they branded it as a gastroenterology uh, mishap. Uh, something like that, but that's what it did some damage to me then. And uh, but that's what uh, that's the valley that God brought me through. Let me uh, hit pause here for a moment, folks. We're going to take a break for station identification. We'll be right back with Ravi Zacharias. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. The hey there, folks. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. I'm sitting here with Ravi Zacharias, Christian apologist, author, uh, former cricketer. Uh, Ravi. You just took us to the darkest place anyone could ever go, which is to say to the point of death by one's own hand. You mercifully survived. And so what happens at this point? You are 17 years old. I'm sure your family is horrified. Uh, and you said someone came to you on the hospital bed who was a Christian. Yeah. And I think it's important for the listener to know, you know, oftentimes there are different reasons for one who would go through that dark stage. Sometimes there are definitely some psychological, uh, neurochemical issues at work and so on. Uh, it was none of that for me. For me, it was the pursuit of meaning. 
and uh, struggling to be accepted by a very disciplined dad and a dad who was tough on me for reasons that he had. I wanted to sort of shame me into reality. I'm sure that's what he meant. But uh, when I went through that dark stage, this gentleman whom I had heard once before, met once, worked for, worked for Youth for Christ, but I was, uh, I was not in the clearest state of mind, you know, lying in that bed and dehydrated, which meant I couldn't use my limbs, I couldn't lift my hand. And he came into the room uh, with a Bible in his hand and wanted to read it to me. And my mother was sort of surprised, saying, how did you even get here? He's in intensive care. He said, well, I'm a minister, and uh, so on. But uh, he, she wouldn't let him stay. Uh, so he opened it to the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, and had my mother read it to me. My mother was a teacher, but English was not her first language, a very heavy accent in English. And here was the King James version. She's holding it in her hand, reading it, and I'm having a hard time tracking what she's saying. But you know, the amazing thing to me, again, how God orchestrated this all, that conversation in John 14 is with Thomas. And Thomas is the one who was the first one to bring the gospel to India yeah. and paid with his life. Yeah. And so the exclusivity passage is there. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. But I was going past all of that until in verse 19, Eric, it's like a bolt of lightning in a moment of pitch blackness. Uh, uh, because I live, you also shall live. Because I live, you also shall live. And with nobody explaining it to me, it had to be the Holy Spirit of God because I was green as far as the scriptures were concerned. Never opened a Bible in my life before. And just say, thinking to myself, whatever this live is about is not what my life was about. And so it's Jesus, of course, talking. And I said, Jesus, if you are who you claim to be here, I want that life that I do not have. If this is the life you offer to me, and I promise if you will take me out of this hospital bed, I will leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. That was the line. I will leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of truth. That's pretty intense for a 17 year old. Very intense, but that's the way I was, I, I still, I'm still a lover of words. I'm a lover of articulating something yeah. with precision. And I said, this is how I'm feeling. And the irony of it is Eric, years later, when my mother passed away, my dad asked me what verse I wanted on her, on her gravestone, and I took John 14, 19. Many, many years went by, and I was in Delhi, and I, my wife, Margie, who's Canadian, she said to me, you have talked so much about your grandmother dying. Have you visited her grave? I said, no. I said, let's find it. And fortunately, in Delhi, there's only one Christian cemetery at that time. We found it, but they couldn't find the, the particular grave. I mean, nobody had been there for decades. Um, she died uh, when, uh, in the 50s, and we're not talking about the 90s, okay? So four decades had gone by. So we found the mark, but it had sunk. We found the plot number, I should say, uh, through contacting the registry. And so I called a gardener with his shovel and bucket, and he starts digging and digging and digging and the dirt's coming up. He's going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I just thought somebody had already plundered the grave. Then he hits stone, some marble slab. And as the stone begins to clear, my wife is standing next to me and she grip, gripped my arm. And there's the name of my grandmother, Agnes D. Monicum. The date of birth, the date of death in 55. Because I live, you also shall live. My grandmother had that on her grave. That, I mean, that is a story. Ravi, yeah. this is one of those stories for people who don't believe in miracles. Yeah. I mean, just the idea that that was the scripture that God used to bring you to faith. Right. Then the idea that it should be on your mother's grave. Then the idea that you should somehow decide to go looking for a grave which is buried underground, which no one would see unless you happen to go there. That's correct. And then as if, you know, f f floating out of the past, here it comes, the same scripture. I, I, I know God has spoken to me that way sometimes, and people often think, well, it's coincidental or it's this or that. But I, I think that when it happens to you, because we serve a personal God, you know it is not coincidental. You know it, it's God's way of winking at you and saying, just in case you wondered whether I'm paying attention to these details, what do you think of this? 
I planted this here in the mid 50s and you see it now. I mean, that, that's staggering. It was uh, quite astonishing to Margie and to myself, and we just stood there. And actually, a long story followed after that. I contacted the Delhi Cemetery Authority, and I said, this stone is just about falling apart. Can we put a new one in? And they said, well, the rules of laws have changed. But I built it up, and my younger brother and I paid for that stone, and now it's very clearly set up in sort of three little layers mm. with the same wording. But, yeah, you know, it's one of those Luke 24-moment uh, type thing where Jesus connects all the dots for the disciples. You know, he's telling them all from the beginning how all of this was meant to be. And they invite him in for dinner, and when he breaks the bread, they say, wow, uh, we, we did not know who was with us at this time. I think in life, God does that on many punctuated moments. Yeah. Just enough to remind you, uh, I'm with you all the way. It's, uh, it's so beautiful. Well, I want to go back then to this moment. So you're on this hospital bed, you're age 17, and you make this vow. Uh, so what happens following that? So you don't become a Christian on the hospital bed as a result of your mother reading this to you, or, or would you say your faith began there? I would say my faith began there, okay. but it matured a lot over the next two to three years through the Ministry of Youth for Christ. Uh -huh. I knew what I had done. I didn't know the depth of what it all meant. I tried to go to a church the next Sunday, or no, maybe a couple Sundays after that. I walked into a mainline church there, I didn't know there were such things as liberal preachers and conservative yeah. preachers. And when I went and told the vicar there what I had done, the minister there what I had done, he just stared at me. He said, uh, you know, uh, this is some kind of uh, melodramatic thing. He said, like sitting at the foot of the mountain staring at yourself or something like that is what he said. He said, you'll get over it. And uh, I said, but I don't want to. I said, what I have just found is what I needed. So then a uh, little later, an American preacher came there and became, his name was uh, Ernest Fritchley. He passed away last year. I still stay in touch with his daughter now who lives in Minnesota. When I started hearing him preach the gospel, I said, this is exactly what I have done, what I needed. So I attended a Bible study with Youth for Christ every Monday night. And believe it or not, within about six months, I was teaching that Bible study from the book of Romans because my closest friend, who later on became my brother-in-law, a Hindu Brahmin, was able to bring him to the Lord. We were walking outside in the neighborhood. Okay, it's a 204 flats there surrounding a field where we used to play cricket. So we're walking past a garbage dump. And uh, at the top of the garbage heap, we see a book. And uh, we lean over, and it says a commentary to the Epistle of Romans by St. Paul, <laughs> by W.H. Griffith Thomas. Oh, my gosh. That incredible writer. Now, till this day, I don't know who threw it there because I don't know if there was a single Christian in the community. I actually guess some missionary had given it to my dad, and he's the one that may have pitched it without knowing what he was throwing away. I still have that, by the way. I still have that volume. I have it right on my desk. You haven't pitched it. No, I haven't pitched it. A lot of a lot of gold nuggets in there. So we started teaching the Book of Romans, and you know the whole idea of justification by faith and the grace. Brand new believers, you know, we just come to know the Lord, and verse by verse, my brother-in-law and I. He's now in the ministry. He was a nuclear physicist by training. Went to MIT. And then later in life, he gave his life to the Lord as a, in ministry, too. He's married to my sister. He now is just retired from being a pastor for 30-some years. And uh, he wrote to me uh, in May. He said, do you remember this day? This is when we walked forward together to totally commit our lives to Jesus Christ at a hill station of Missouri for a YFC summer camp. Just the handiwork of God, you know. This is, this is beautiful. I'm so glad that... Uh that you're here, generally speaking, and then specifically to get this story from you. People need to hear these wonderful stories that what God does in people's lives. Folks, I'm talking to Ravi Zacharias, the one, the only. This is the Eric Metaxas Show. Do not go away. Hey there, folks. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. I'm sitting here with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi, you have a new book out called The Logic of God, 52 Christian Essentials for the Heart and Mind. This is a devotional book. Uh, and I want to talk to you also about uh, the book that came out last year, Jesus Among Secular Gods, The Countercultural Claims 
of Christ. But before we get to that, I want to just continue with your story, if we could. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. A young man comes to faith, and, and you come to faith dramatically and very, very uh, intentionally. It's, it's not everyone is like you, and it's amazing to hear how everyone is different. So you dive in, and before you know it, you're teaching a Bible study from the book of Romans, of all things. That's not exactly an easy book. Um, and, and what happens to you subsequently? Do you, do you know rather quickly that you want a life in ministry? Uh, good question. No, I don't think so, although it would have been fascinating. The thought would have been fascinating. In India, you don't have any models for that. You know, I suddenly didn't want to become a pastor. This is the uh, 60s, roughly? Uh, the, that is correct. Yeah, mid-60s. Uh, yeah, well, I would not have think, uh, thought of becoming a pastor. Uh, and then the ones I met were missionaries. They were from overseas. So those were the only two models I actually saw. I don't remember ever meeting a single itinerant who was doing evangelism of any repute out there. I'd heard of Billy Graham. In fact, he came to our church. I've got a picture when he visited uh, the Centenary Methodist Church in Delhi, uh, sitting on the platform. It's a small church, but he came and spoke there. Uh, what happened was I was going into the hospitality industry till this day. I really love the hotel industry, the food industry. It, uh, don't you don't you pretty much live in hotels at this <laughs> point do, in your life? I'm on the right side of it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, so I was. I moved to Canada when I was 20. My and why? Father, why? That's it. My father sent my older brother, who's 22, and me 20, uh, to get. I was going to go to Cornell, take a degree in hospitality management. Of course, Cornell. They I, they have that. I have had friends that have gone to Cornell for that specifically. Very well recognized. So, but it's, it's not in Canada. No, I got a visa to go to Canada first uh -huh. to work. Uh -huh. I was going to earn my way, save some money. My dad and mom couldn't have supported me with that cost of education. So while I was working in the hotel industry, they're getting some experience and working, uh, I started taking some part-time part -time courses at a seminary in Toronto. And again, I just, I don't know how all of this happened, you know? I mean, uh, why did I start doing that? I was working nights. Why do I need to be awake longer during the day? But it was that hunger. I just wanted to study. I'd never heard of the term systematic theology, never heard of the great uh, church fathers and all. But I was taking these courses, and this was like, my appetite was being stirred. I was excited about going to two, three hours of lectures every day. And while I was in the thick of that, fascinatingly, because there were such few Indians in Toronto at that time, only 500 Indians in Toronto when we arrived, uh, today there are 500,000 plus. Wow. So, I mean, it, they, in fact, we used to be introduced as two Indian natives. Uh, who have arrived here in Canada whenever we were introduced in church. So my brother, well, he was uh, very sensitive. He said, what do you mean natives? You know, do I want to bring a spear here or <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> so anyway, they, they, then they changed it to Indian nationals. But my brother got a job with IBM. He loved the computer world. Within five days, he got the job, ended up becoming a systems engineer, then starting his own company. I was plowing through this whole a hospitality industry, and I was getting more and more restless for a couple of reasons in the hotels. I looked at the life there, and uh, without getting too detailed, I said, is this what I really want? Eric, things happen after midnight in those places that, you know, are not, is not good for anybody, for the family. That was the first thing. Second thing was we worked long hours. We were working, or I would get home only about three in the morning. I was uh, overseeing banquets where I was working. So by the time it all, they all left and tallied the money and all of that. She locked up all the expensive liquors, all this kind was going on. I said, is this really what I have in life? But in the meantime, just before I left India, at the age of 19, the first Asian Christian Youth Congress was held in Hyderabad. I went in order to cheer for the Delhi team. They were coming from all over. The fellow is now my brother-in-law, Sundar Krishnan. He was a brilliant guy. He was to represent Delhi in the preacher contest. But he the didn't. preacher contest. That is correct. I can't believe that. Yeah. He didn't come because uh, he was a good student. I came because I didn't worry about my studies. The examination time. So I, although I was doing well by then as a new believer, I was just trying to stay as much as I could at the top of my class. My principal loved me, and he said, look, I know this is in your heart. You go. So I went. 
I represented Delhi, and unbelievably, I won the pre won the Asian Youth Preacher Contest prize. It makes no human sense <laughs> because anybody who knows you knows that you just don't have any homiletic talents. It had to be God, Robbie. It's so obvious that it had to be God. <laughs> well, so this miracle yeah. happens, and you win. <laughs> you win the preaching contest, and. Um, what does this lead to? That's the seed that the Lord may have sown in my heart. Yeah. That there is a possibility that I started considering. Could I take the platform someday and speak for my Lord? But I didn't know what it would look like. So at one point, I had to tell my dad I was losing interest in the catering industry. Uh, what I really wanted to do with my life was prepare to become a preacher, but I had, had no idea in what. I mean, we knew of Billy Graham, we knew of the Canadian Barry Moore, but these were the big guys, you know, and I wasn't setting yeah. my sights so high. And so I went to formal theological training in what is now called Tyndale College in Toronto. At that time, it was called the Ontario Bible College. I went there, finished my four years bachelor's, followed that at Trinity in Deerfield, Illinois. Hang on one second. We're going to go to a break, and we're going to get the rest of this wonderful story with Ravi Zacharias. Stick around. Hey there, folks. That's Orleans. I'm Eric Metaxas, and I'm sitting here with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi, you're telling us this extraordinary story. You, you seem a man on a mission, even that early age, before you meant to be on a mission. You're studying and studying, and you said you went to Trinity in Deerfield, which is in Chicago. Um, so at this point, you know that you're on this ministry uh, path. Did you think at that point that y you would be uh, the pastor of, of a local church, or were you thinking of something along the lines of what your life has now become? So you, when I went to Trinity, Eric, it, it was uh, 1973. So I was then uh, 27 years old, and uh, I had already had a life-changing experience just prior to that. In the year 70, 1971, when I was 25, I was invited to preach in Vietnam uh, through uh, the daughter of Je the famed Jonathan Goforth of China. Uh, Alice Jeffrey. She had invited me to go to Vietnam because she'd been a missionary there for nearly 50 years. And she said, you know, the American troops are there, the country is falling apart, the young people have no models to this listen is, to. This is before the fall of Saigon. That is correct. Yeah. Saigon uh, fell in what, 75? Uh, Seven, it was 75, yeah, 75 but, but yeah. this is sometime before this that. This was in 71. Oh, I'm there. sorry. Yeah, go, ahead. Yeah. go ahead. So I went there and uh, I traveled through the length of the country. Uh, I was with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the denomination that I later on got ordained with. But the American troops got me around in their helicopters or I drove on the lonely highways. Right, this is amazing. I had no idea that that you or anyone had done such a thing. To be preaching in Vietnam in 1971, it's well, one thing for Bob Hope to crack a few jokes, but uh, <laughs> I really have never heard anything like this. It was amazing. Again, it, it, the, as I sit here talking to you and you retrace your steps, you see the hand of God and all. Now, there were great missionaries there. The church the, it was called the Tin Lan, the Good News Church, and the National Protestant Church of Vietnam was the CNMA Church at that time. But there were many other missionaries there too. But for them to trust a young guy like me, you know, I'm still uh, halfway through my theological education. But what happened was revival broke out through those meetings. My interpreter was about 17 years old. Uh, I was shocked how God was using us. Only I had one sermon book. I kept it in my jacket. I don't know, there are a handful of sermons. I just kept repeating them, moving through every city. Uh, I still remember one of them was the cross of Christ that I preached again and again. And every time uh, people would respond in one of those sessions in Nha Trang, uh, just about the whole student body walked forward and fell on their face before God. And that again was the uh, imprint of God reminding me what he could do with me. So to answer your question, by the time I got to Trinity, I knew evangelism was really flowing in my veins, but I didn't know exactly what. So here I am at Trinity, studying on some of the greatest minds of that time. You know, Carl F. H. Henry, John Gerstner, Kenneth Cancer, J.I. Packer, John R. W. Stott, I. Howard Marshall, Lisa Archer. They were all there then? They were all there at the same Holy time. Holy cow. And then the two that changed my path were John Warwick Montgomery and Norm Geisler whose funeral I just preached at I was last just, Saturday. Wow, he just so passed away. Just That's amazing. I mean, two of the pr premier apologists uh, I, I've uh, had the <clears throat> privilege of 
meeting John Warwick, Warwick Montgomery, but uh, never Norm Geisler. But you, uh, so yeah, you sat at the feet of, of some uh, some of the greats of that day. I still can't believe they were all there at Trinity all there in the at 70s. The same That's time. amazing. And, uh, you know, Thomas McCombsky, Walt Kaiser, they were in the Old Testament department under Gleason Arch. I mean, Gleason Arch's book, Survey of Old Testament Introduction, we called it the Yellow Bible. You know, and Dr. Stott was teaching the Sermon on the Mount. You know, J.I. Packer was doing his lecturing there on the sovereignty of God and evangelism and so on. Now, as I look back, and you know how it all happened was I was actually headed elsewhere. I won't name the school I was going to, but I bumped into John Stott at a meeting in Toronto. And he just listened to me for a few minutes. He said, looking at the heartbeat you have and the passion you have for evangelism, apologetics is what you need. Ravi, you should be going to Trinity. So I literally got into my car, drove to Chicago a few days later, met Kenneth Kanser, who was the dean at that time and one of the finest theologians of those days. And uh, that's, that's what became the story. And after being under Dr. Geisler and Montgomery, watching their incredible debates at that time, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to defend the gospel for Christ's sake. Uh, Montgomery, of course, was sort of uh, with a two-edged sword. You know, he'd pierce the opponent. That was not my goal. My goal was to win the opponent. Is, that's always the trick, isn't it? In other words, when we're talking about debating about God, I have seen people uh, win debates and lose uh, souls. In, in other words, it's one thing to win an argument, as yeah. you just said, but it's another thing to win another person to Christ. Right. That's a tricky thing, isn't it? It's very tricky because uh, the audience can draw less out of you than that. You know, they may goad you in a different direction, or yeah. your opponent, if he or she is clever. Yeah. They're like Lewis, you know, one of his most famous debates, how he nearly walked away with his head hanging down, felt yeah. he'd been beaten up at that. Yeah. Uh, I have never felt that urge to knock over a person. Uh, I felt, have always felt the urge that if this person with this zeal and this ability could find the truth in Jesus Christ, that's who they would actually be debating. So I uh, went to training in uh, uh, apologetics under them, and after I graduated, traveled the world. I graduated in 76. 77, the CNMA sent me around the world, 15 countries over 48 straight weeks. I preached 576 times with my wife and my two-year-old daughter, and I came back a changed man. I was worn out, but I said, this is my calling. Wow. I am an evangelist in my bones, and that's what I want to do. Um, it's fatiguing just listening to you recount that in a sentence. Uh, the, the idea of doing that is extraordinary. And you've been doing that, Ravi, uh, for a little while now. Yep. I mean, this is coming up on, you know, you, you we're talking about 50 years of, of this kind of activity. Um, when we come back, uh, more folks with Ravi Zacharias. Uh, this is the Eric Metaxas Show. You can find us at metaxastalk.com. You can find me at ericmetaxas.com. Don't go away. Hey, folks, it's the Eric Metaxas Show. I'm talking to Ravi Zacharias. Ravi, uh, in the second hour, I want to talk to you uh, uh, about your books and about apologetics specifically. But in the few minutes we have left, um, it, take us forward. I mean, you say that that was this... Uh, signal year in your life kind of uh, determines the future. And, and now uh, it, it's been, uh, you know, more than four decades right. that you have been doing just what you did that year. I hope you're doing a little less preaching than 500 and something sermons a year. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, that was, uh, that was a year of uh, many great uh, success and uh, stories, but also a lot of lessons learned. You know, you can't push your voice. Uh, you, I paid the price with my voice. I had to come back and have vocal cord surgery. You're, that, are you yeah, kidding? I, I didn't. They, wow. They had to remove some nodules, which they did. Uh, but uh, all that aside, I found my calling, Eric, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody would want to listen to me Sunday after Sunday in the same church. I'm too intense. You know, I've got a lot of passion in what I say. A pastor's privilege is to present line upon line, to build the truth and let the truth do that persuading over a period of time. 
We evangelists go in for shorter spans. So we have to come in with that intensity and the passion because whoever is coming is also coming sort of once in a way for that. So that's what I was called to do. Uh, and I be began doing evangelistic work. You're right, it's about 47 years since uh, I did that. I started that and never looked back. I know right now this is my calling and that's why it was so critical that I marry the right person because they pay a higher price uh, when you're an itinerant out of the door so often. If your spouse is not more committed than you are to the calling, it's just not going to be uh, that which would work mm. out. And then my kids, you know, I had three, have three children, five grandchildren. It's not an easy life, you know. Can you remember the kids' names? <laughs> That's key. <laughs> the harder thing because was, if you can't, then <clears throat> probably you need to spend more time at home. And more important, if they still love and respect you, you know. That's much more important. Yeah. Wow, that that is a uh, it's a heavy price. Billy Graham spoke about that very often yeah. about how difficult yeah. that was. Yeah. Uh, and how he might have preached less, actually. As he got older, he was uh, thinking about that. Um, so w what is your schedule like these days? Uh, how often, how many countries are you in uh, per year? Uh, how many times do you speak, roughly speaking? Because you're now 70, 71? 73. 73? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, born in 46. Uh, I wish I could say I have slowed down, but I... I think I'll average about a couple hundred days on the road this year. I'm trying to bring it down to about a hundred in two years. I'm already quite committed for the next year, so I'll have to pull back. Uh, I feel the anointing of the Lord as rich as I ever have. I'd be a liar if I didn't acknowledge that. But at the same time, you have to have wisdom and know when to hold back, you know, that's a harder thing. And now the grandkids are growing up and they ask me questions. Are you gonna be here for my birthday, Papa? And that's a heart melting question, you know. Uh, so it's important that I spend more time writing and more time now on our base in Atlanta. But it was in 1984 that we founded the ministry as it stands now, uh, RZIM, uh, which is a ministry of evangelism undergirded by apologetics. We have a staff of between two to 300 based in 15 countries and with 90 full-time apologist speakers, wow. some of the finest voices I, that you'll hear. I want to talk to you more about that in our, in our next hour. Okay. But before we go, I want to give people the website, uh, rzim.org. That's Ravi Zacharias, International Ministries. Org, R -Z -I -M org. Ravi, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Hey there, folks. It's Eric Metaxas Show. I get to continue my conversation with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi, welcome back. Thank you. I want to talk to you about everything, so that's a problem. We have limited time. Um, you, uh, you have a book out uh, called Jesus Among Secular Gods, The Countercultural Claims of of Christ, and you have a new devotional out called The Logic of God. Let me ask you, Ravi, uh, there, there are so many people uh, in the culture in which we live that don't believe one can rationally um, make the case for the God of the Bible. You've spent uh, 50 years doing just that. What, what do you say to somebody who says that these are things that we can't know or there are too many questions for me to make a decision? Well, I think the, it's partially true. There are too many questions. The fact of the matter is uh, there are many unanswered questions for skepticism also. Yeah. There's even more unanswered questions in the anti-theistic or atheistic worldview. I mean, when a person like Richard Dawkins raising all these questions about the horrible things of the God of the Old Testament, but then ends up saying, ultimately, we don't, I don't believe there's any such thing as evil. We're all dancing to our DNA. So the God he takes down, he takes down on the notion of evil. But then when he comes to defend his own view, he says there's no such thing as evil. We're all dancing to our DNA. So obviously he didn't want God to dance to his DNA. He just wanted us to dance to our DNA. I think Chesterton's comment is very appropriate here. He talks about the fact that for the Christian, joy is central and sorrow is peripheral. For the skeptic, he says sorrow is central and joy is peripheral. And what he meant by that is, why is joy central for the Christian? Because the fundamental questions are answered. The peripheral questions are not answered, and so sorrow lingers on the periphery there. But for the skeptic, the fundamental questions are unanswered. That's why he thinks of 
pessimism and meaninglessness and emptiness being at the center of it, and the peripheral questions are answered, therefore the laughter and the frivolous nature of life and so on. I think that is true, because when you, what are the fundamental questions of life? Why am I here? What does it mean to be human? How do I differentiate between good and evil? What really brings meaning? How do I find fulfillment in sexuality with the, with the legitimate boundaries that, it ought to, that we enjoin? What happens to a human being when he or she dies? Those are the fundamental questions. Those are the ones that define who we are and how we should live. And so I think the rational arguments and the existentially relevant arguments are on the side of the theist, not on the side of the anti-theist or the atheist. If I were not a believer in God, I would have no way to explain absolute moral reasoning, nor would I be able to explain the purpose and meaning of human life. Don't you think that the, the issue, for me at least, uh, the issue is that in our culture, we give a pass uh, to atheist points of view. In other words, we ought to mock them, ridicule them, we ought to call them out, we ought to hold them to account, hold their feet to the intellectual fire. That's never done in the culture unless someone bumps into uh, you or a handful of figures. I mean, when I think of the Charlie Rose program, all of those years, I I don't think I ever saw anyone like you on that uh, program. In other words, everyone has these questions. These, these are not peripheral questions. Every human being has these questions. But you would get the idea from the culture that we don't have any good answers. Yeah, and I think they've actually concluded that there are no answers because they think there are no good answers. They think there are no answers whatsoever. And yet, Eric, you know, my experience all over the globe I mean, why in the name of reason did China become the fastest growing church in the world? They lived with the atheistic underpinnings all that while. Why can you go to Moscow today and see an auditorium full of young people coming to listen to an open forum? Why is a, a per capita Iran one of the fastest growing churches right now in the world on a per capita basis? We, uh, my colleague and I were in Cairo and we saw so many come to Christ night after night in Egypt. They themselves are moving away to a natural, to an atheistic framework because their own worldview has not given them the answers. I think the answers of Jesus are so profound, Eric. You know why I am here, what my marriage means, how to raise my family, but it is all based on the fact that we have essential worth given to us by God himself, not some kind of extrinsic worth given to us by some temporary state or order of some uh, leader. To, to have that essential value given to you of every human life and to have the wisdom and the legitimacy of options and whatever it is that God is calling us to in, 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 our, in our existential reality. There are no answers in the naturalistic framework. And that's why the best known philosophers will make me, even Bertrand Russell would say, you know, I don't know why I think there is good and evil. I have no satisfactory explanation. Or others saying without an ontic referent of an infinite being and a purposeful being who has created us, there is no basis for deciding between good and evil. So I think there are rational arguments, there are existentially relevant arguments, and there are empirically verifiable propositions in the scriptures. The Bible is not just a book of some spiritual ethereal stuff. There's propositional truth of geographical realities that can be tested against what the claims are. The Bible is the most unique book when you've got a volume for 1,500 years, 66 books, 40 different authors, all pointing to the birth, life, death, and resurrection ultimately of Jesus Christ. I think it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful cohesive narrative. I, I think, uh, yeah, if people are honest with themselves, I think they have to conclude that if I must choose, and I must, this has to be the best choice by far. There, there's no doubt. In other words, you'll always have questions. But what amazes me, Ravi, is that we live in a culture that doesn't encourage us to choose or to think things through. It, it encourages us to distract ourselves away from making those kinds of decisions. You are so correct. And the way you phrased it in your opening lines, that's exactly actually what Anthony Flew ended up saying before he died. 
He said the worldview that from which he represented the atheistic worldview just didn't fit together with the facts as he sees them. And fascinatingly, he pointed to two authors, to C.S. Lewis and N.T. Wright. And he says, C.S. Lewis's argument for this moral framework with which we think, and N.T. Wright's argument for the bodily resurrection of Jesus, he says, if those two realities are true, it makes absolute sense. And he said the same thing. No other worldview does. If there is one, it has to be this Judeo-Christian worldview. I mean, uh, it seems to me uh, very clear. But as I say, I think we live in a culture where no, nobody is forced to think it through. In fact, they're encouraged not to think it through. But when I think of, of what folks uh, like Richard Dawkins and so on have gotten away with, it mystifies me that they're able to get away with such incredibly sloppy thinking. I mean, if you say that I don't have any real basis on which to determine what is good or evil or whether there are such things as good or evil, then I would simply say, why should I take anything you ever say seriously? Especially since one of the major arguments they have against God is evil. Yeah, he's so terrible that I don't want <laughs> yeah, to believe in him. That's and right. then you think, well, where do you get this idea yeah. of terrible so from? So he's obviously got some intuitive certainty about what God ought to not be like, but some certainty about what uh, life is like. It, it is, it is, it's a very, very strange thing. And we are, of course, living in in strange times we're living in. I would you know, say that uh, when, when you began uh, in the 70s, there was a different mindset where I still think there was respect for the idea of truth and logic. And we, we seem to have moved into a place now where, where truth and logic are dismissed almost as patriarchal constructs, mm -hmm. that they're part of, a, of an older way, and that if you're tr trying to convince me with logic, there's some deception there. I'm not gonna buy into your phony logic. Well, and that's why along with all of that, we have lost civility, we have lost hope, we have lost any ma manner of proper reasoning across uh, political lines and theories. And if I were a young person growing up today watching the behavior of some in leadership uh, and how they ever got into office to say what they do and the irrationality of statements that come out almost every day in the news, aided and abetted by mass propaganda as well, they seem to take the weirder stuff and put it up on the front page. Of course. And the reason is because logic and reasoning has gone. And once you've done away with logic and reasoning and moral reasoning particularly, as Gertrude Himmelfarb in her book Roads to Modernity points out, that the United States did not have, like the French philosophes, reasoning alone, rationality. It was moral reasoning that was at the foundation of the US and the UK. So I think when we've lost that, then we've lost behavioral norms also. I don't know why they don't connect the dots and see why our culture has become so violent and so vicious and so disrespectful at the same time as we have tossed out the notion of a moral order and of God himself. That's the, this is the logical outworking of what we have actually done. Uh, I'm sorry to agree with you. Uh, it, it is a, it's a difficult and strange time in which we live. People often say, and I agree with them, that our, our only real hope is for revival, that we need spiritual revival. Uh, otherwise, uh, in a way, it becomes impossible impossible for us to see what we need to see in order to do what we need to do. We'll be right back, folks, talking to Ravi Zacharias. You can go to rzim.org and find out more. Oh, hello. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. I'm sitting here with Ravi Zacharias. A lot of you are thinking, so Eric, shut up quick so Ravi can talk. Ravi, it's such a joy to have you here. Now, you always have a new book out. The newest of your books is called The Logic of God. Uh, it's a devotional, 52 Christian Essentials for the Heart and Mind. 52, I'm just guessing. Does that have something to do with a deck of cards? What's the significance <laughs> of 52? Well, I think uh, it reveals much more my way of thinking and the number of their 52. It is the fact, Eric, when I take a thought for the day and I do my devotions for the day, and then all of a sudden next day you need, need to read another two or three chapters and you keep moving on, the treasure of yesterday suddenly gets replaced by what you've just done again this morning. I like to meditate, cogitate on issues that have really made an impact on me. And I thought to myself, why take a daily different passage? Take one or two central ideas with a particular passage 
and let it form your life for the week, thinking on these, reflecting, and then allow your own natural imagination to add to it and uh, other thoughts. So this was to be done once a week, every Monday. I had actually called, titled the book, Thank God It's Monday, but uh, the publishers didn't like that. Publishers are always wrong, especially <laughs> Zondervan, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, no, it's so funny. Z publishers, people always say, why did you name your book? Why do you, and you go, well, I, I don't, you know, there are publishers, they have ideas, and they have sales forces, which are the most wrong of all. <laughs> and they have these different ideas. The logic of God, they seem to think that would sell better. We'll find out, won't we? Well, won't we, Ravi? Won't I think we? It, because it, to me, when I look at that, yeah, I talk a lot about the pattern of God's thoughts, let this mind be in you with Jesus Christ Jesus. Thank but the average person says, doesn't read it that way. Thank yeah. God. See, that's the point. The, yeah. the, the title becomes irrelevant if people aren't reading what people think, you know, is there. The logic right. of God could mean anything. Thank God it's Monday. That is tremendous on at least two points. And you know that, right? I mean, thank, thank God it's Monday. If you are looking for hope in life, you say, thank God it's Friday, I, I want to, but, but thank God it's Monday, it's countercultural, yeah. but then also the idea that thank God it's Monday, I get to do another wonderful, hopeful, exactly. devotional. Exactly. I think the people at Zondervan are really, really kicking themselves right now, as they should, as they should. Um, I, I have to say that uh, a devotional from you, uh, after all these years, why did you wait till now? People would have thought that you might have done this a long time ago. Yeah, I think uh, the answer to that, too, was the publishers came to me and said, you know, you write so many things over a week, over a month, and so on, that would make beautiful, reflective reading for yeah. somebody in a devotional pattern. Yeah. So it was their idea. So it was Zonovan's idea that then, then technically they get to title the book. Okay, so I take it back, everything I said. <laughs> um, well, the, the book, The Logic of God, let's talk about the meaning of what you just said, the yeah. logic of God, because your whole life has been summed up in a way by expressing the logic of faith and uh, unpacking, I hate that verb, but unpacking the logos, trying to make it uh, understandable to minds. Uh, and so is that part of what's running through this? Well, what's running through this is the questions that haunt us oftentimes where we run into some dead ends on answers. The logic of God is intended to unpack God's answers on different themes. For example, if you have a deep regret of something that happened last week, you know, how do you get over that? You say, I ought not to have done that, I ought not to have said it, why did I make that mistake? Or even in a message, you say, boy, that one line I ought not to have said. There's one essay there called, Please Shut the Gate. And it's taken from an essay by F.W. Boron, the English writer. He said he used to go for a walk every morning and he would uh, see a, a farm where he would want it to walk through, but there was just a sign on it, Please Shut the Gate. Because if you don't shut the gate, the critter is gonna follow you and wreck your whole walk to say nothing about the farm. And so he takes that thought, please shut the gate, and he weaves beautiful the notion of memory and its profitability, but also the pain that it can bring. And then ultimately he will take you to the verse. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Borum had that brilliant way of taking thoughts and then anchoring it at the end. So I did an essay borrowing that title, how do you cover the past regrets for the present and the future. Then there's uh, essays on problem of pain, suffering. You know, how do you, how do you answer that? The question of meaning, the question of finding transitional moments in life. So it takes various questions that we have, brings it into a devotional for the day, and then there are discussion questions, and it can be done as a group too. I, and those ideas were all Zondervan's actually. I did the writing, and so I was very happy that we could uh, write I, it. I guess I'm pretty lucky to have them as a publisher suddenly. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that, that's very interesting. In, 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 in these conversations, the name C.S. Lewis keeps popping into my mind. Uh, he has to have uh, had at least some influence on your life because we, I guess most people would think of him as somehow the premier apologist of the 20th century. To what extent did he influence you? Lewis influenced me a lot, but not as much as one might imagine. Of all people, I think there were a couple of writers that really influenced me. That would be Malcolm Muggridge and G.K. Chesterton. Ah. Muggridge's ability to turn a phrase, 
uh, you know, when he wrote on almost anything, for example, his book, The End of Christendom, which is a slender volume on Pascal, yeah. absolutely brilliant. He wrote one called Christ and the Media on the danger yeah. of what the eye gate was all about, yeah. and how it could manipulate. Yeah. So I would say Malcolm Muggeridge was the number one person that probably because of the way he articulated uh, he was more a, a, a social theorist, I would say, I, or a moral. I wanna, I'm going to cut you off, but I want to come back and talk more about Malcolm Mugridge and about Chesterton with Ravi Zacharias. Stick around. Hey there, folks. Uh, I almost said I'm talking to Malcolm Mugridge. I'm not, actually. I'm talking to Ravi Zacharias. But, Ravi, you said that Malcolm Mugridge was a great influence on you. Literally last night, uh, I popped in a DVD that I got uh, either from eBay or something. Uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Mugridge uh, talking about the lives. I don't remember the title of it, but the, but the lives of six people, I think Pascal, St. Augustine, uh, and it ends with Bonhoeffer, Tolstoy, whatever. And I watched the one on Bonhoeffer. And it was made in 1974. And it was an extraordinary thing because it was the first time I had ever seen Bonhoeffer's fiance on film. Probably the last time I'll see her on film, but she's interviewed, this would have been 74, three years before her very early death from cancer. But I was marveling as I watched the documentary uh, at what I ought to have known and probably did know, but, but his facility with language, and I thought, my goodness, I need to go back and read Muggeridge, because apart from Chesterton, as you mentioned, there's, there's really nobody quite like Malcolm Muggeridge, and, and many people don't know who he is, just like young people haven't heard of my, my hero and friend Chuck Colson, you think Malcolm Muggeridge is worthy of, of reading, but what, I mean, I assume you met him. Yes, I did. Yeah, only once, though, uh -huh. uh, when I visited his home in Roberts Bridge in England. I was actually speaking at some meetings, and I quoted him two or three times, and somebody came from the audience and said, do you know that Mr. Muggeridge lives just down the road? I said, no, I didn't. He said, would you like to meet him? I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, would you? I said, it would be a dream come true. Next day, I had lunch with Malcolm and Kitty Muggeridge in their home, a simple a peasant uh, type lunch, you know, with the uh, crusty bread and cheese. Ah, what a what an afternoon! And he took me through the wall of his pictures. You know, he was well loved in India. He taught journalism in India for some time. He was the first one to call out Stalin for who he really was. And when he, in his book Winter in Moscow, he was a, a contributor to the Guardian, I think, and then became editor of Punch magazine. I forgot he was yeah. editor of Punch. I mean, he he was such a legend, and I read a lot of his books when I first came to faith. But I, I have you know halfway forgotten about him. So to hear you mention him, he he was you know, what do they say, sui generis. There's, yeah. There was no one like right. him, absolutely no one like well, him. Well, I remember one of his lines. He said when he would meet up with God, he was going to ask God to forgive him for being so fatally fluent. <laughs> <laughs> because he had manipulated, in his own words, you know, ideas as a journalist. He would make things seem what they were just by the use of language till he met Christ. And I think, uh, you, know, you know the name of Fred Barnes, uh, the, the journalist here. I asked Fred Barnes once, how do you come to know Jesus? He said, oh, that's interesting. Two British journalists were visiting our home. They were staying with us. And uh, after they left, my wife said to me, there's something about those guys. I want you to find out what makes them tick. So he said, I wrote to them. I said, my wife wants to know what you make guys tick. And the reply came in the book in the mail, Jesus Rediscovered by Malcolm Muggeridge. And you know, it was Muggeridge that, now, there's a lot of things in that book, there's a lot of things in Muggeridge theology that I don't quite agree with, but he loved Jesus. And I think his farewell address at St. Giles in uh, Edinburgh, when he quit the chaplaincy at the university there because of all that was happening, that talk of his, I think it's in Vintage Muggeridge, the book Vintage Muggeridge, that farewell address is so powerful in which he talks about, he said, I have no way to, no desire to stand in your way of pleasure, but whatever else life is about, it's not going to be found on the plastic wings of Playboy or in psychedelic fancies. And so I stepped down from this position because of the decisions the university is making here. Wow. He had found Christ and he knew 
how devastating the culture had become in that day. And this was in the in the early 70s? Yes, sir. It, I think it was 74 or something yeah. like that when he quit the chaplaincy. Yeah. He'd become chaplain. Imagine that, chaplaincy in in, in, uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. And, and can we credit him essentially with the quote-unquote discovery of Mother Teresa? I, I would say so because... Uh, what did what did his book call the something, something beautiful, beautiful for yeah, God? Beautiful for God, yeah. And I think uh, he just said she turned his life around, uh, and that was uh, that was his own testimony uh, to the twentieth century pilgrim or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and this, therefore, I mean, what a different take by Muggeridge vis-a-vis some of the other atheistic thinkers who went. Oh yeah, pretty. well, and he wrote. Didn't he write a memoir called The Green Stick? Yes, sir. I, I guess. I read these many, many years ago, but I feel uh, renewed zeal to go back and look up. That Muggeridge. was his volume one of a two-volume series. Right. The second was the Infernal Grove, and the, uh, the Green Stick, a chronicle of wasted years. That's it. I mean, that book was, I mean, That's loaded it. with phrases. So, to me, the precision of articulation yeah. is what enamored me with the way Muggeridge wrote. Yeah. I said he opens up vistas that nobody else does, and for the gospel's sake, that's what I wanted to do. Wow. Um, We have about a a minute left to talk about Chesterton before we go. Again, there is nobody like G.K. Chesterton. Obviously, he influenced uh, C.S. Lewis and so many others. And after you leave, I'm talking to a Chesterton expert, oddly enough, to talk about Chesterton. But for people who don't know Chesterton, what was it about him that spoke to you? you, Did you read Orthodoxy first? Yeah, I think that's one of the best books ever written. It is. Especially that chapter, The Ethics of Elf My favorite chapter, probably, of any chapters in the world. It's such a slender book, Eric. But yeah, you've picked up the right. His everlasting man is tougher but Lewis says that it was the everlasting man that put the last link in his own spiritual journey. Wow. So he credited that book with something very I just think once again Muggeridge being a, uh, an analyst of society in that day with those pungent one liners, yeah. even his poetry uh, I mean I went to visit his home and sat in his chair for some time. I think between Muggeridge and Chesterton is a toss-up. Who yeah. Who is the greatest wow. of the 20th century there, yeah. Well, Chesterton, I mean, you talk about a way with language. It's stunning. I mean, he thinks in aphorisms. Yes. And, uh, but the first 50 pages of The Everlasting Man are really tough. I mean, That's I remember right. thinking, where am I? <laughs> and then finally it gets a little clearer, but so much of his stuff is, is just genius. Ravi, I'm, I'm sorry uh, we're out of time, or you're out of time, but uh, we're just so happy, finally, to get you here in the studio. I want to tell folks again about your books. Jesus Among Secular Gods, The Countercultural Claims of Christ, came out last year. And then the brand new book, The Logic of God.